want to string inverters, industrial motors, and EV charging stations have in common? A need for short circuit protection. And this here chalk talk. If you're working on one of these kinds of designs and you're using TO247 switches like MOSFETs, IGBTs, or silicon carbide MOSFETs, it may be time to take a closer look at isolated gate drivers with programmable features. Yes, you heard me right. Isolated gate driver features that you can program. Bam. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Isolated gate drivers are a crucial design element that can protect our designs from overvoltage and short circuits. But how can we fine tune these isolated gate drivers to match the design requirements we need? Let me introduce you to the Ice Driver X3 single channel, highly flexible isolated gate drivers from Infineon. My guest is Perry Rothenbaum from Infineon. And in today's Chalk Talk, we're taking a closer look at the programmable features included in these isolated gate drivers, how their reliable and accurate protection, precise and fast on and off switching, and DSAT protection can make them a great fit for your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Perry. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about the X3 digital gate drivers today. But Perry, before we get started, what kind of designs is this board perfect for? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, Amelia. The X3 digital gate driver is really designed to take TO247 switches. And when I say switches, I mean IGBTs, silicon MOSFETs, or silicon carbide MOSFETs that are in TO247 packages. The board comes without any power switches inserted so that you don't have to desolder something and you can put in your choice of power switches. We have both the user guide and the data sheet online, and you can download those when you need them. Excellent. Okay, Perry, can we dig into the details a bit? What kind of features are we really looking at here? Well, the X3 Digital has a lot of features, and in particular, it has more features than any of our gate drivers, and we owe that to the I2C interface. So let me go over the features, and you'll begin to see why it has so many. So one of the things we offer is an adjustable input filter that ignores shorter time durations so that if you give it a signal, you can say, okay, hey, you know, my signal isn't stable until 45 nanoseconds or some programmable time that you can say ignore and only look at my input signal after this time duration. A really nice way to eliminate noise works very well and it's programmable. We have plus and minus current sources, three, six, and nine are typical sources that we offer with the X3 Digital, and they can do both sourcing and syncing. We have adjustable clamp or clamp drivers or ADC pin. So we have a, a multifunction pin that you can program and set to your desired function. And of course, the I2C interface is what really gives you the ability to look inside this gate driver and look at what's happening, what temperatures are occurring. You can change settings. It's a really great interface that allows you to fine tune this part to conditions like temperature changes or maybe even under multiple uses. It could be that you're driving different projects or different loads. So it's really a nice feature. The other thing that we offer is saturation detection. We call it DSAT. And what DSAT does is it's a pin that goes to the drain or the collector of your switch. And what it's doing is it's looking for some voltage that should never be there. So for instance, if you short circuit, normally when you turn on the part, the collector emitter or the drain to source is almost zero volts, you know, 100 millivolts, maybe 200 millivolts, but it certainly shouldn't get to like eight or nine. So what DSAT does, it says, okay, if I've turned you on and you've gotten to eight or nine volts, then we've got a short circuit condition and I need to turn off and report a fault. Now, the beauty of a programmable part, and I can tell you that you have to pick a part number to get a different DSAT voltage. Here, 
you can program that deset voltage. You can say, hey, I should never get three volts or I should never get six volts. You can set it based on your application. So if you have a nine volt deset and you have a very low ohm, let's say MOSFET, then a huge amount of current's gonna occur until you get to that nine volts. Here, you can say, okay, hey, I should never get to three volts. Okay, and that already represents 100 amps. So here, you can really adjust where that overcurrent occurs and where DSAT happens. By the way, you can also filter DSAT so that you can say, I don't want DSAT to react to an overcurrent if it's 100 nanoseconds, but I do want you to react if it's you know, a microsecond. So very adaptable, programmable for your application. And if you look at that picture that I have, you notice that I said in my description, there's two resistors there. So we give you separate source and sync outputs. Now, if you look down at that little timing diagram that I have, what that's really showing you is not just how DSAT works, but how our counter works. And what does it really mean to have a counter for DSAT? So DSAT works with two different voltages. Remember I said you can set it if you have a short circuit. Maybe you can set it to six volts. Okay, if I ever get to six volts, turn off. That's really a short circuit. Don't want to ever be on for that. But what if I said I really shouldn't have more than 200 millivolts? So if I keep getting to two volts, that's a condition that shouldn't occur. And what I might want to say is that how often is that condition occurring? Because if it's occurring a lot, there's a problem. So if you look at that waveform that I show, there's a counter and a limit. And then those little pulses above that, those are overcurrent occurrences. So what happens is every time an overcurrent occurs, it starts counting PWM cycles. And if the overcurrent occurs again in before five PWM cycles, it increments the level of that count. It's a level detection. And what happens is, and it resets the PWM cycle counter, and it says, okay, start counting again. And if another overcurrent occurs, say before five PWM cycles, it'll increment it again. But if five PWM cycles occur and there was no overcurrent pulse, then it'll decrement that level. So it's really kind of an averaging of how often these overcurrent pulses are occurring. And if, like you can see on that second event where it goes high, you can see that the level was fairly high, and then you got two rapid occurring overcurrent pulses, and it increments, increments again, and eventually you can see it got to the limit level and the fault occurred. You can set this. You can say, hey, I want it to be 10 PWM cycles you know, before I increment or decrement. So it's completely settable. It's a way for you to say there's other overcurrent conditions that I want to know if they happen too often. And if they do, I want to be sent a fault or a flag. DSAT, on the other hand, is absolutely destructive and you want to turn off right away. So all that functionality, all that programmability and information that you're going to get because of these two levels in DSAT and because of the I squared C programmability. Okay, so Perry, can you give me some more details about the gate driver programmable features? I can. So one of the features that we have is called two-level turnoff. We abbreviate it as TLTO. And it's a voltage control turnoff. So after a short or an undesirable high current, you can have a controlled turnoff. You can also use it just as your normal, typical current turnoff. The reason we do this is because a voltage controlled turnoff reduces the amplitude or the current. And this basically reduces the DIDT. And we want to reduce the DIDT because a high DIDT with PCB circuit inductance. This comes from the traces on the circuit board. You can have a fairly high inductance. This can cause a voltage spike. If you recall that equation, V equals L di dt, that L in that equation comes from the traces on the circuit board. And if that voltage spike exceeds the limits of the part, this can lead to a destructive avalanche breakdown. So controlling that turnoff is important. And let me take you through kind of the sequence of how TLTO works. 
will start with the IGBT being on. And if you look on the right-hand side of my slide, you'll see that there's a waveform. And so you can see where it says in. So that's the input signal. So let's start with the input signal being high or set at VCC. The IGBT is commanded off. So you can see where that in goes to low. And shortly after that, the gate begins to ramp down to an intermediate voltage level. This is actually called plateau in the data sheet, not to be confusing. But it remains at this intermediate voltage level for a period of time, which is settable in the X3 digital by a register. So you can set that amount of time, allow it to discharge. And this reduces the magnitude or the amplitude of the current, basically reduces the DIDT. Then after this time period of reducing, the gate now continues to ramp down until it's off. So basically in summary, two-level turnoff allows an adjustable slope. It allows an intermediate voltage level to be attained for a period of time, and it allows time durations at each of these levels. So this prevents basically that destructive turnoff that I was talking about. And obviously, as you can see from the waveform, this is all sequenced and you control each of those sequences. So the other thing that I'd like to throw out is that TLTO can also be triggered by your processor. So the ready C and the fault end pins can be used to actually turn it on by the processor. And you can connect all the fault N and ready C pins together. So if a one driver detects the fault, it can clue the other drivers in and all of them will turn off with two level turn off. So that's pretty much how this feature works. Two level turn off, I said, was a voltage controlled. And what we also have is soft off. Soft off is a current control turn off. So it's enabled after desaturation detection or by a fault, or it can be just turned on by the micro. For instance, you can know you have an overcurrent because you're looking at a sense resistor and saying, okay, start the soft off. And what soft off does is it's a controlled turn off, kind of like two level turn off, but instead of being controlled by a voltage level, it's controlled by a current control turn off. And the same advantage is you don't have that DVDT and the soft off function, again, it's that I squared C capability to adjust this without having pins adjust the four bit value. So you can set different current levels that you want it to turn off at. It could be work with an IGBT or silicon carbide, it, basically with a reduced gate current to reduce the DT induced over voltage. So you control the gate with the current based on like a short circuit or an overcurrent condition. So you can control how fast you turn off. So Perry, are there any other features that these gate drivers contain that you think are important to mention? There are, because this is a feature filled part, it actually has more features than any of our other parts. You have more capability to look at preventative maintenance, learn more about your system if things are beginning to change. And some of these extra features is what I'd like to go into. So we have a hardware under voltage lockout protection with hysteresis on the input side. We have also under voltage lockout on the output side. So what are these? Okay, what these are is that, let's say you're driving a gate on a MOSFET. That gate on the high side has to be pulled up sufficiently to drive the part. Under voltage lockout can say, okay, if that is not sufficiently pulled high enough and it's programmable, then you can say there's a fault. Under voltage lockout guarantees that if I'm not pulling that high enough above the drain, I'm going to fault. Also on the input side, if my input VCC is somehow failing and I'm not giving sufficient voltages on the input side, I can also under voltage lockout. This guarantees that your power supplies are operational and within parameters to make sure the part's going to operate within operational parameters. ADC measurement, we can actually measure with an ADC internal parameters such as internal temperatures. And what that allows us to do is by knowing 
what the junction temperature is and knowing what the thermal resistance of the part is, you can also know what the ambient temperature is. So this is a feature that's also in the part. Pin state reporting via I squared C. What that really means is that you can query uh, states through the I squared C and see how states are changing. The other important thing is that we have tight IC to IC propagation delay. Why is that important? Well, a lot of times, if your propagation delays aren't the same, what happens is the one that's longer becomes the actual time that you have in the dead time. Even though the turn on time was much shorter, the propagation delay during turn on was shorter. If the propagation delay during turn off is longer, that's a disadvantage to you because the whole cycle has to be as long as that longest time cycle. By matching these, we're saying, hey, it's 30 nanoseconds propagation delay during turn on and 30 nanoseconds during turn off. That really allows that dead time to be shorter. And you don't want a lot of dead time. A, it creates harmonics. B, it's a time where you're not really driving any power. So the shorter the dead time, the more that works in your favor. So our rise times, our fall times, and our propagation delays are very short. And like I say, the propagation delays are matched, so it keeps everything short. And that's a big advantage with this part. High common mode transient immunity is very important in that this really prevents changes from the hot side, the output side, from transferring back to the input side. You know, you can have all kinds of low impedances and you can do all kinds of protections and layout things on the output side. If those transients travel back to the input side where the processor is, it can drive the input side high or low without you meaning to do that. And then it feeds right back out to the output. And again, you can turn on or off when you don't really intend to. You want to have a very high CMTI to prevent that from happening. And we have that in this part, 200 kilovolts per microsecond. So, Perry, I can definitely see how this kind of isolated gate driver would be a good fit for a bunch of different applications. What are you seeing in this case? Well, this part does work with a lot of different applications. The part itself uh, actually has a 2300 volt isolation. So you can use it with 650, 1200 volts, 1700 volt ratings that require 2300 volt now, you might say, why would I want to use a 2300 volt part where my other parts are 650 volts? It's because you're not really paying for that 2300 volts. You see, if you look down at that picture, we use a transformer isolation. And achieving 2300 volts of isolation, you're not paying anything more for that. It's kind of like a freebie by having a cordless transformer, which is what we have in this part. And then when you have a cordless transformer, you get fast responses from the input to the output, and you get really excellent isolation, which is why we can offer 2,300 volts of isolation. The other thing that we offer is a 40-volt maximum on the power supply. So if you have transients on your power supply or you have a power supply that you're using for other parts of your circuit, we can handle up to 40 volts. So this is a really great feature that we offer with our part. Excellent. Now... Perry, what about the output side of this evaluation board? What are we really looking at here? Well, amazingly, everything we've been talking about was about the gate driver. So let's really talk about this eval board that you're going to be getting. And if you look at point one, DSAT is connected to the drain. So this is showing you pin 13 DSAT. It goes through a resistor, through a diode, to the drain of the part. So how does DSAT work? DSAT drives a current through the 1K, through the D65, and that current then goes from either collector emitter or drain the source when the part is on. Now, if you don't have a short, that drain to source or collector to emitter, depending on the part you're using, is going to be of extremely low voltage. And what's going to happen is that current source coming out of DSAT is going to be sunk onto a very low resistance. So really, the DSAT pin will see very little voltage going back to it. But as you begin to have a short, that voltage from collector emitter or drain to source begins to build up. And as that build up, that voltage is fed back through the DSAT. It keeps seeing a voltage increasing, increasing, increasing until it hits that DSAT trip voltage 
and it trips. That's how DSAT works. Now, you notice that R65, so all of our other gate drivers, they're not programmable like the X3 Digital is. The R65, because there's a current source coming out of DSAT, there's a voltage drop across R65. So you have two mechanisms that are causing the voltage at pin 13 to increase. One is the IR drop, that voltage drop across R65, also the voltage you set DSAT to. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is almost all of the other parts that are offered do not have programmable DSAT. The only way you can control them is with this R65 resistor. So by changing that resistance, you change the voltage that comes back on pin 13. And that's how you adjust DSAT on all of our other parts, unlike the X3 Digital, where you can actually set that voltage. And in fact, if you wanted to, you're not dependent on R65 to set the trip level. So the advantage of DSAT is that it can be precisely set and you can also have a capacitor on DSAT. I think there's one here. And right now you can insert it or not insert it. What that capacitor does is it gives you a delay on DSAT. So should DSAT occur right away or should it not occur right away? You can filter that DSAT voltage as it comes back. It can actually charge up that capacitor through that R65 resistor and give you a delay. So very programmable by external parts, but also programmable by the X3 digital itself. So the clamp is set up as a driver. You can see the clamp right now, and I should have mentioned this before. When you have a clamp, typically the clamp has the switch inside it to pull all the energy out of the gate. But what if you're using a switch or parallel switches or using a module, something that has so much capacitance that you can't really pull all that energy into the gate driver. Well, what we allow you to do is to say, I'm gonna program my clamp instead of just using an internal switch to sync all that capacitive current, I'm going to drive an external switch. And that's what you're seeing when you look at pin 10. You notice it's actually driving an external part. That part is now connected to the gate of the switch, and now that external part is sinking the energy to ground, or minus VEE, depending on how your system is set up. But the point is you're not pulling all that energy into the gate driver because there's so much of it in your particular application. Remember, if you don't have a lot of power device switches in your application, you don't need this external switch. You can set the X3 digital and say, you're not a driver, you're a switch, and you're a clamp switch, and you're just going to take pin 10 and go straight to the gate. Your choice. Very adaptable, very programmable. So isolation is also an important aspect here as well. What does Infineon offer in this case? Isolation is very important. There's different levels of isolation, and they are really reflective of the agency testing that is done to achieve those isolation certifications. So we have functional isolation. These are still galvanic isolated parts, but we don't guarantee agency requirements. Like for instance, here on the middle one, you can see 1577. It has to withstand 5.7 kilovolts of voltage tests for a specific amount of times. And there's a bunch of other tests that they do for 1577. So if you want something that's guaranteed to pass 1577, then you want to pick a gate driver that has that 1577 certification. VDE11, which is called reinforced isolation, is an additional level of safety. For instance, if you use the requirements set by 1577 in your circuit, meaning you don't hit certain peak voltages, and you adhere to what's required for VDE11, it's a lifetime of 37 and a half years for that part to survive. So on this next page, you can see functional versus reinforced, and you can see kind of what that difference is. So functional, it can go all the way up to 2300 volts, but we're not giving you 37 and a half years lifetime. Reinforced is designed where if you stay within these parameters of these conditions, that you will actually get that extended lifetime. For instance, I was in the appliance world and we had to design parts that you know lasted for 15 years. 
guarantee. It's got to last. So the parts are kind of gauged for those kind of lifetimes. So reinforced isolation gives you higher voltage isolations. But if you adhere to these levels, you'll get a longer lifetime. And this is VDE 11 reinforced isolation. So Perry, if my audience is interested in checking out this board, where should they go first? We have these EVOL boards in uh, our distributors, and we also offer some of the publications for our boards on our website. So the EVAL board, uh, this is a number, it's a EVAL 1ED38X0DCT. If you purchase the board, you can download the information from our website or from your distributor. I'm sure they have the user manuals there. But one of the things that I would like to bring up is that we have a companion board that runs with our eval board. Now you might say, what do I need a companion board for? Okay, if you get an eval board, how are you really gonna run this? Yes, you may have your own system already running. You can just plug it right in and away you go, but you may not. You may want to play around with this eval board and get used to how it works. And the companion board is a way to do that. It's a board that allows you to plug the eval board into the companion board, and then the companion board plugs into your PC, and you can download our GUI. And what that GUI does, it allows you to kind of get familiar with how that I squared C works and what you can expect in sending and receiving I squared C commands. It really makes the development much easier rather than having to write C code and change everything. It's a lot easier to take a GUI and set the DSAT or the soft off or the under voltage lockout, program the Miller clamp, two level turn off. You can actually watch all these programmable features occur. So Really, the evaluation board with the X3 analog and half bridge configuration, the reason why I'm mentioning the X3 analog is it's one of our boards that is very similar to the X3 digital, but it doesn't have that digital interface. So it has many of the same features. If you're one of those people that says, I don't want that software interface, I just want something analog, you can kind of get the X3 analog it's very similar, and we have a board uh, for that. And what that gives you is the same galvanic isolation, except instead of programmable with the digital interface, it's resistor-based. So you might set a resistor to set your DSAT or to set some of the functions via external resistors. We understand that you know, some people don't want that digital interface, so we offer it in both styles. The application note for the X3 Digital is also on our website, and this is the order number for that board. So the uh, GUI test bench for the eval is below, and you can actually just type that straight into our website, and you can install the GUI and get the information right there. Remember, the GUI app requires the companion board. It's not something you can use on the eval by itself. The GUI board has a processor that's designed to communicate with your PC. So you would want to use that. Okay, so Perry, what kind of applications are you seeing this driver being a good fit for? There's a lot of applications that the X3 fits. And, you know, I don't want to say to you it's only good for super high power applications. Not true. Like I showed you, it comes in three, six, nine current sources. So it's not like you have to have this super high power application. It's really there to give you more safety and more information about how your drive is operating. Here is a good example. We, it's very commonly used in, in this industrial motor drives in harsh environments. And because of harsh environments, uh, they're often used at reinforced isolation and DSAT for short circuit protection. If you look at string inverters you know, for solar, they often require a Miller clamp. X3 has the Miller clamp, UL1577. We've got UL1577. They work with CoolSick uh, with short circuit protection, and we offer that protection in our X3 driver. If you look at UPSs, they need a very high current source. So 
on a high power UPS, even greater than 50 kVA. We offer that nine amp current source sink. Again, if you're driving that much power, you're going to want that Miller clamp. And again, the short circuit protection is included. Great for UPS, commonly used for UPS. EV charging, you know, relatively new, is a perfect application. Whether you're using MOSFETs, silicon carbides, or modules, they require 1577 certification. They absolutely need a Miller clamp and they need short circuit protection. All of that you're gonna find in the X3 Digital. Excellent. Well, Perry, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Amelia. I really enjoyed being here. (laughs) And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal.